Hello, you're listening to Chain Reaction, the Radio 4 show where an endless purgatorial circle of minor celebrities are asked to interview each other until eventually there is simply no one interesting left to speak to. (laughs) I'm Stuart Lee, I'm a comedian and writer, I'm also 36 years old and a big fan of comic books and I will fight anyone who has a problem with that. And this week I'm lucky enough to be able to interview one of my favourite comic book creators. Uh, Even if you've never heard of today's guest, it's almost certain you've enjoyed some aspect of popular culture that's been influenced by him. He was born in Northampton in 1953, where he continues to reside, presumably as an act of willful defiance. Uh, He wrote scripts for various significant superhero comic books in the 80s, including Watchmen, Swamp Thing and Batman. His story has been made into two financially successful Hollywood films, From Hell and The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. In recent years, he's written and performed a spoken word piece about William Blake, published a novel called The Voice of the Fire, set in Northampton between the years 4000 BC and 1995, a time span which makes Geoffrey Archer's Cain and Abel look like an act of literary cowardice. (laughs) And he's also devoted much of his spare time recently to the worship of a Roman snake god called Glycon, who was exposed as a glove puppet sometime in the second century. (laughs) Please welcome, have you guessed who it is yet, Alan Moore. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. So, for a bit of context, what are the first kind of, kind of comics that you ever remember buying? The first comics would have been British publications like the Beano, the Beezer, the Dandy. For the, the working classes, British comics were just something that you had, like rickets. <laughs> um, and so it, it was kind of automatic. And it was pretty much the same kind of lives that me and my friends were actually enduring you know so to read about them wasn't that exotic so what was the stuff you saw that was different to that in the market stores in northampton i can remember that there was one place that used to specialize in these very bright four color dc and marvel superhero comics these would have been back in 1960 when this kind of big superhero boom was yeah. just kicking off i mean an interesting thing about it is you talk about it being on a, on a market store you know and it's not in a designated comic book store or, or whatever and i think when we were young, if you were interested in, in American comic books, you had to kind of seek them out. There wasn't a distribution network. They were mainly brought over because they were used for they were ballast, ballast. For they shit. were ballast, yeah. yeah. There can be no higher compliment for a writer than to feel that his work was ultimately used as ballast for a ship, can they? But, <laughs> I mean, basically, well, there's two major comic companies then, weren't there, which mm. was DC, which was Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Marvel, Spider-Man, and the Hulk, and yeah, Fantastic yeah. I mean, Four. Like, with the, the DC comics were always a lot more... True Blue. Very enjoyable, but yeah. they were uh, big, brave uncles and aunties who kind of but probably insisted upon a high standard of, you know, mental and physical hygiene. Right. And, <laughs> and like, whereas the Stan Lee stuff... Marvel, the Marvel comics. The Marvel yeah. comics, yeah. He went from one-dimensional characters. Their only characteristic was that they dressed up in costumes and did good. You know, whereas Stanley would, he had this huge breakthrough of two dimensional characters. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, they dress up in costumes and do good, but they've got a bad heart. Right. Or a kind a of bad leg. Bad leg. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I actually did for a long while think that having a bad leg was an actual character trait. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's almost <laughs> enough, isn't it? It's it worked enough. for Byron. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, the superheroes, it only really works when you're a kid, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, like, when I was actually, I think, seven, I decided what I wanted to do with my life, which was to actually put on a costume and fight crime. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, well, it's obvious, but what else are you going to do? Yeah. You know? And I got my mum to make me a costume. Well, it wasn't really a costume. It was a kind of a vest. And <laughs> I wore Wellingtons uh, because that was the nearest I could get to the sort of superhero boots. Yeah. And I got a mask on. And I remember hiding in a tree. And that I, your I don't know what I was doing. Was I don't know sp- what I was thinking. Was that your special power? I jumped down. Yeah, I could hide in trees at will. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I remember sort of jumping down and surprising, well, 
frightening. <laughs> yeah. uh, my school friends. And they knew who I was instantly. Mm. I said, why are you doing this, Alan? Why are you dressed like this? And that was a revelation. I, I, <laughs> because, I mean, all Clark Kent had to do was to just kind of mess his hair up a little yeah. bit and take the glasses off. And nobody even noticed that him and Superman were the only people in Metropolis with blue hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of your subsequent work has been characterised by a desire to kind of expose the limitations of the superhero genre, and it sounds like you were doing that from a very early age. That was... <laughs> I, I, I realised the limitations of the superhero genre <laughs> yeah. from an early age, yeah. put it like that. The first Marvel comic you bought was, was Fantastic Four 3. Yeah. That, is that right? Yeah. I looked at a reprint of that today, and I was wondering... That issue was The Menace of the Miracle Man, issue yes, three, that's yeah. Right, yeah. Which, given your subsequent involvement in magic and the occult, there's some great lines in it. Look, the Miracle Man, they say, he is actually floating in the air. He can do anything. And he says, Bah, next to my power, the Fantastic Four are nothing. I sneer at their puny powers. I mock their childish feats. He's basically a magician who goes bad. That has says, obviously had a huge influence, <laughs> influence on, on you, me. Didn't I mean, it? I've, I've taken him as a role model to, <laughs> in many regards. He I? declares war on the human race and intends to conquer the earth. Yeah, that's fair enough. All right. <laughs> so how did you get from being a comics fan then to actually drawing and writing stuff? I suppose that come around about the age of 25, I was married and we'd got our first child on the way. And I'd always had a vague idea that it would be nice at some point in the future to actually make my living out of doing something that I enjoyed rather than something that I despised. Yeah. Which was like everything other than comics, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so I figured that, you know, my wife was pregnant. If I didn't give up the job and make a stab at some kind of artistic career before the baby was born, then I, I know the limits of my courage and I wouldn't have been up for doing it after I'd got these big imploring eyes yeah. staring up at me you know so I quit and I did practically nothing for a year well I, I was convinced I was doing something I was starting all of these gigantic space operas that I was going to sort of sell to 2000 AD I was going to write them and draw them and like I think about six months later I'd got one page half penciled um, some inks and I just thought why am I doing this and actually I realised it was because I was never going to finish it right and you set yourself an impossible task yeah, so that you I'd never be have to be judged yeah. at that point I decided to get serious and a friend of mine Steve Moore no relation who'd been working in comics since he was 16 told me how to actually lay out a script right. and I started submitting stuff to the British comic scene and it all went on from there. Really. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned 2000 AD there. That was quite a big deal, wasn't it, for giving an outlet to British well, talent? Well, it was, I think that it was because you'd got really funny, cynical writers working on 2000 AD at that time. Yeah. This was mainly Pat Mills and John Wagner, who had previously spent 11 years working on the British girls' comics. Right. And they had grown cynical and possibly actually evil <laughs> <laughs> during this time, because I, I think it was John who used to write a strip called The Blind Ballerina. <laughs> and it, as the title suggests, it was about a ballerina who was, was blind. And John would just try to put her into increasingly worse situations <laughs> at the end of each episode you'd have her evil uncle saying yes come with me you're going out onto the stage of the albert hall where you're going to give your premier performance and it's the fast lane of the m1 right and she's sort of pirouetting and there's trucks <laughs> bearing down on her and but those kind of things that were inappropriate in girls comics became the staple of 2000 AD, the British science I mean, fiction comic. Well, hell, they were funny, even yeah. in the girls' comics. <laughs> yeah. But when John had got a science fiction comic to play with, he could really amp up the humour. And I, I saw this stuff, and I thought, these people are intelligent, there's satirical stuff. I could maybe write something that would play to this audience and would also be interesting for me to write. I guess the, the kind of highest profile work you'd have to that was, was V for Vendetta. I was looking back at some of the actual British comic characters that I remembered from when I'd been a child, and most of them were sociopaths. You know, you look at all the American heroes, and that's what they are. They're heroes. 
But I don't know whether it's something to do with Robin Hood or Harry Wood the Wake or Dick Turpin or all of these other thoroughly unpleasant people that we've made into Mad Frankie Fraser, mm. you know, <laughs> uh, that, that we sort of, we love a gallant rogue and we also love a murdering, psychotic, horrific travesty of a human being, you know. <laughs> but I thought that maybe I could exploit this. I mean, maybe I could have a character where you've got some kind of grim, totalitarian police state in Britain of the unreachably far future, like 1997. Yeah. <laughs> one, one of your visions of that nightmare future was uh, that there would be surveillance cameras on every street. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we were doing a Braille edition, but David Blunkett or somebody got hold of it, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is all my fault in some obscure way, you know. That strip was about a character who kind of wanted to destroy British government and society. Did that reflect some kind of anger that you, f you felt yourself during the Thatcher years? Well, it was, yeah. I think I'd always had a lot of sympathy with anarchy. And during the Thatcher years, this was about 1981 that I'd have started writing V for Vendetta, 1982, something mm. like that. The riots were kicking off at Southall and Toxteth, and all of a sudden, what had been a relatively stable country had now got very heavy-handed riot police going in and beating up demonstrators. It was starting to look a bit futuristic and a bit grim. Right. Basically, with V for Vendetta, I'd got this fascist police state and I'd got this very romantic anarchist terrorist. There's still been some talk about doing a film of V for Vendetta, but... I don't know whether America is ready for the terrorist <laughs> Events hero. Events have got ahead just, of it a just, bit, yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. No, but, there, was, uh, there was a film of one of the other characters you closely associated with. Swamp Thing was uh, an existing DC character that was kind of your break into... Uh, yeah, well, I'd, I'd started to win a few awards over here for things like Beef of Vendetta. Yeah. And these awards were voted for by 50 people in anoraks with <laughs> awful social lives. <laughs> and, <laughs> The Americans, however, to them, every award is an Oscar. Mm. And so they thought that I was an award-winning British genius. And, and uh, so they rewarded you by giving you one of their most unpopular characters. Yeah. To write. Well, <laughs> it was much better to be given a comic that was on the verge of cancellation. Yeah. Well, you, you took it from 17,000 to 100,000, didn't you? Over yeah, the, over the time like you were, that. Yeah. There was, there was a lot of characters. There was The Heap, there was Man-Thing in mm. Marvel Comics and Swamp Thing. They were all basically the same, which was a... A man who looked like he was sort of made of vegetables that lived in a swamp. Yeah. And, uh, and you did a standard Alan Moore move of taking the character on and totally changing a whole backstory of it and starting from scratch again. Yeah, yeah. You? Killed him off in the first issue. <laughs> yeah. You know, and people stood still for it because it was a dopey premise. The whole thing that the book hinged upon was that there was this tragic individual who is basically like Hamlet covered in snot. <laughs> It's, he just walks around feeling sorry for himself, and that's understandable. Yeah. I mean, I would do, yeah. you know. But everybody knows that his quest to regain his lost humanity, that's never going to happen. No. Because as soon as he does that, the book finishes. Right. And even the most naive reader is surely aware of that. Yeah. So I thought, let's turn it around and make that not an issue anymore. Let's see what's interesting about being a vegetable creature. Yeah. You could kind of make him a kind of a swamp god. You could make him a kind of a, an elemental force. You could also use him to talk about environmental issues. There was actually quite a lot of application yeah. that you could give to this big kind of animate manure pot, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really, you know, a compost heap. We did a kind of a tour of America where we were taking some of the standard horror tropes, vampires, werewolves, mm and tying them into things that were social problems in America at the time. That was quite instructive, actually, because there was no problem at all with doing stories that suggested that Americans were racist, sexist, all the rest of it. They yeah. said, yeah, we are, and thank you for pointing it out to us. You know. <laughs> and then I did a story that suggested that perhaps if they didn't have quite so many handguns, it might be a generally nicer place to live. And they went berserk. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but, so uh, it's like someone going, I picked up this comic about a sentient vegetable in good faith. And, and then told I found me, out it told it's me got that got I didn't have the right to sort subtext of... to it. 
<laughs> um, after that, I suppose you got um, allowed to play with the original characters for DC that you'd created for Watchmen, which is, to this day, something of a phenomena in the comic book industry. It had your name banded around the smiley face of the covers of Watchmen tied in with a kind of acid house movement as well. It was very much a pop cultural phenomenon. What was the sort of premise of, of, of Watchmen then? It was extending the premise of a previous work of more in Marvel Man. Right. That was a reinvention of a 1950s character. It had always been a very innocent, naive American superhero knockoff. But it was putting a character like that into a real or at least more realistic world. And that seemed interesting. Yeah. It was like I was saying earlier about the motivation for superheroes and how difficult that is because there aren't really any sensible motivations for dressing as a bat and fighting. I mean, like, you know, your parents get killed in front of your eyes. That's tough, you know. Yeah. I mean, no one's saying that that isn't difficult and it wouldn't be traumatic, but a bat. <laughs> <laughs> I, like the, I mean, I like the, cla the classic, there's a classic image from a very early Batman comic where, confronted with the death of his parents, Bruce Wayne says, now I will dress as a bat. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's not come out in, in 20th century psychology as a, as a standard response. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, look, I, I did a parody of it in one of my <laughs> recent comics where I have the main character's parents gunned down in front of his eyes, and he says, my parents have been gunned down in front of my eyes. I will become a mumbling, traumatised street person <laughs> and scare everybody, not just criminals. <laughs> we'll talk about the 500-page comic strip about the, the the jack the ripper murders which is probably one of the things that a kind of casual listener will know you from in that there was a hollywood film of it a couple of years ago with with johnny depp from hell from hell yeah which was adapted from your work but you've never seen it yeah well when adapted very loosely yeah i suppose the beauty of the of the, the comic book is you've got these 40 pages of footnotes it's not really about jack the ripper it's about how we relate to the city of london i suppose yeah. and the psychological overtones what that's boiled down into in the film is a thing about a bloke who goes around killing women. Killing women, yeah. I mean, which was what we were trying to avoid in the book itself. Yeah. There have been innumerable films about Jack the Ripper. And I'd kind of got a bit sick of the way that Jack the Ripper, it was a kind of, it was a kind of pornography. And I don't mean that in a good way. No. You know, it's, uh, it was a pornography... <laughs> Of violence. It yeah. was just this standard setup where you've got the unrealistically attractive Whitechapel prostitute who's obviously got a great wardrobe manager, great skincare specialist, and like she's walking home, she's perhaps singing some sort of musical song in a slightly <laughs> tipsy voice, and then she'll turn down an alleyway and you'll see this shadow follow her down the alleyway, the shadow of the top hat, the Gladstone bag. Mm. Her footsteps start to get faster and you can see the fear in her eyes and then, you know, it's a dead end. She turns round, she starts to scream, you see the raised knife and then it cuts to a policeman saying, oh my God, and blowing his whistle. <laughs> Well, and well, that's you, a pornography. Yeah, well, what you're talking about there is a kind of eroticisation of sexual violence. Yeah, that's, that's not exciting. That's just horrible. And when the film came out, Inevitably, they make it a whodunit. Yeah. Inevitably, the prostitutes are all implausibly attractive again. You know, I mean, I thought it was much better to sort of say practically from the second chapter, yeah, this is William Gull, who was the person that I picked as a fictional yeah. culprit for the Jack the Ripper crimes. And uh, then not to talk about who did it, but to talk about what happened, because... To a large degree, I think that murder, which is a horrible human event, it's kind of been turned into a middle-class parlour game yeah. by a lot of very well-meaning lady novelists. Yeah. You seem to be applying to, to the Jack the Ripper story, then the same kind of thing that you said to the superheroes is not who did this, but why did they do it? Well, exactly. I'm assuming you haven't seen the film of The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen no. either. No, 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 no. No, in fact, <laughs> I've... Um, I'm getting worse instead of better with regard to the films. I've had a spectacular tantrum. Even by my standards, I surprised myself. You right. know, I've, I've decided that I don't want anything more to do with films at all. Yeah. yeah, after the stuff with the League, there'd been some minor lawsuit with somebody claiming that I'd got the idea 
from an American <laughs> and um, an American Hollywood screenwriter. And you can imagine how I felt about that. Yeah. So I thought if I'm going to react, I may as well overreact. You know, so I, I said, right, that's it. No more Hollywood films. I, I don't want... And if they do make films of my work, then I want my name taken off of them and I want all the money given to the artists. Right. And I thought, God, that sounds principled and <laughs> almost heroic. <laughs> and then I got a phone call from Karen Berger the next Monday. She's an editor at DC Comics. And she said, um, yeah, we're, we're going to be sending you a huge amount of money before the end of the year because they're making this film of your Constantine character with Keanu Reeves. <laughs> and I said, right, OK. Um, <laughs> well, take my name off of it and distribute my money amongst the other artists. And I thought, well, yeah, that was difficult, but I did it. <laughs> and I feel good. I feel pretty good about myself, you know. And then I saw David Gibbons, who I'd done Watchmen with, and he was saying, oh, Alan, guess what? They're making the Watchmen film. <laughs> and I said, with tears streaming down my face, <laughs> I said, take my name off of it, David. <laughs> you have all the money. And then I got a check for the V for Vendetta film. I mean, this was just... It, it was... <laughs> This was within three days. You Does that know. make you believe that there was some kind of God punishing you for your... Punishing me, yeah, or at least he'd got a kind of a sense of humour. Yeah. You know, that I don't know what I was thinking of, but, <laughs> but I've, I've said it now, so I've got to kind of stick with it. But on the other hand, just for the look yeah. on Hollywood producers' faces, yeah. if he doesn't want the money, what, what does he want? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you can't you can't put a price on that, can you? You can't. You put can't. A price on it. Not that sort of entertainment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just the, the weird thing about you going through all that sort of darkness of from hell and those very sinister notions is that the next work I was kind of aware of is, is you going back to much more innocent approach to the superhero genre with Supreme and some of the subsequent stuff with the ABC. Well, you weren't embarrassed about there being a super dog and whatever. In fact, I you... loved all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, like, I remembered what it was that I'd actually enjoyed about Superman when I'd been a, a kid. And, yeah, all right, there's the power fantasy, I suppose. You know, like, gosh, if I was Superman, then people wouldn't beat me up. But that's not really it. I think that it was purely because Superman and characters like that, they suddenly opened up this kind of wonderful dimension of the imagination that I previously hadn't had access to because these ideas were brilliantly stupid. You know, I mean, dogs with capes. <laughs> and, and Batman's dog had got a mask. Yeah. In case any of the other dogs recognised <laughs> him. What I've always regretted in uh, Supreme, the Superman pastiche, is even though you took on a lot of the really ridiculous things about the Superman myth, you didn't have a Super Moby Dick of Space character. I don't know if you remember that. The Super Moby Dick of Space, did that ever? Was this no. a wonderful dream <laughs> it was that a, you no, had? It was, <laughs> it was a whale. It's in an early 70s Superman. It's a whale in space with a little... It's with a white, cloak. with a little red cape on, yeah, and it flies around. <laughs> I wish I'd remembered that. <laughs> but I'm going to check it out now that you. Well, there might it. be uh, some opportunity for a kind of dark take on that, <laughs> where it <Ooh. laughs> kind of comes back, perhaps with some grudge against whalers or something. I oh yeah, I, I'd give him yeah, depth and traumas and things <laughs> yeah. like that and issues. Yeah, yeah, issues. a bad leg, bad leg, yeah. definitely. Yeah. The, the, the last thing I wanted to talk about, there's a, a comic you do through ABC called Promethea, mm -hmm. which looks like a kind of Wonder Woman-derived notion of a young girl with a secret identity of this kind of magical Amazon hero. Mm -hmm. But you described it yourself as a magical drone disguised as a superhero comic. Presumably that dovetails into a position you found yourself in, in well, yeah, where you I mean, now, that's a big part of your life. Well, when I was just about to turn 40, I was just reviewing my options, and I thought, well, I could have a midlife crisis and just bore everybody senseless by going around saying what's it all about what's the secret of life things or i could actually really really disturb and terrify them <laughs> by actually saying yes i've decided to become a magician i've decided to become a master sorcerer <laughs> you know and it really put them on the spot because mm. it sounds so obviously mad. Yeah. 
but they didn't seem to want to argue it with me because no. I'd thought it through quite well. Yeah. You know, I mean, my initial stance was to tell all my friends and loved ones, look, I don't know what I'm doing with this. It sounds like it's probably dangerous. According to all the literature I've read, nine-tenths of them all end up balmy. You know, it's sort of... So if it looks like I'm going mad, then perhaps you could kind of pull me out of this. And, right. and they were saying, yeah, so, like, how are we going to know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I said, yeah, good point, good point. <laughs> so the only thing that I could think of was if the standard of my work or my amount of productivity starts to drop, that is a, a time to get concerned. And... That didn't happen. If anything, I have probably been much more productive, certainly over this last four or six years. I, no I noticed um, the American writer Robert Anton Wilson on a list of ten Alan Moore heroes. He uh, experimented with following a different religion every week or a different belief system to see if they would work. And he started off with Catholicism, Buddhism, whatever, and by the end of the book he's just getting litter out of bins and trying to divine it like runes. He was kind of of the opinion that if you stuck to a belief system, you would see it confirmed in the world around you. And is that is that kind of what you were doing here, I just choosing that, an yeah, option, yeah. I mean, seeing if it works? see if this works. And it's like, basically, that is true. If you adopt the belief system, a belief will change your entire way of perceiving things. It's funny, because when I was kind of mapping out the narrative of this interview, I sort of thought that talking about your experiments with magic at the end would bring it to a close, but it feels like it opens up a whole it's other a whole can of worms. area. So I don't really know how to stop this now. <laughs> 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 it would be good if you could just say something kind of pithy that will um, <laughs> that will help stop it. <laughs> because, I, um, that, that's wildly optimistic, Stuart. I, mean, okay. I, I, I really don't think I could. I mean, I suppose the thing with magic is that a lot of it is about writing anyway. To cast a spell, that's a fancy way of saying spelling. A grimoire, the big book of magical secrets, that's a French way of saying grammar. It's all about language and writing. It's all about incantation, it's all about all these things. And so magic, really, it turns out to just be a continuation of the stuff that I've been doing anyway using certain arrangements of words or images to affect people's consciousness. You know what? That sounds like a good end. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming, uh, Alan Moore. Thank you. Thank you.